One of the reasons mathematics education fails so often is that the subject is mired in obsolescence and an irritating amount of abstract mystification. Of course, many academic bullshit artists find a way to make a living by means of such mystification, but most people assume that mathematics is a clear and rigorous subject. One must be careful with the emphasis on rigor, because it's an affliction of pedagogues born with their head on backwards, systematizing us to death with their sideshow monstrosity called set theory. I won't comment on the Egyptian parallels or sinusoidal snakes I see in the integral signs, but I will only say that modern practitioners fail to understand the historical roots of or motivations for their subject. The Pythagoreans are falsely credited with many mathematical discoveries but their religious attitude toward numbers has been with us through the centuries. While most modern exegetes deride numerology, they still harbor fundamental irrationalisms at the core of their subject, especially concerning the mathematical continuum. Those such as Graham Priest have even went so far as to modify logic where it has diverged from mathematics, following the dictate of David Hilbert that quote no one shall expel us from the paradise that Cantor has created for us. Priest makes the fundamental and left brain mistake of thinking he can transcend the double bind in Eastern religion by accepting contradiction rather than refining the assumptions and language. This expresses the primary narcissistic regression of the infant, where the boundaries of the self are still poorly defined and the map gets confused with the territory. This psychological regression is at the root of Platonism and its fundamental reification fallacy. The use of abstractions to reach outside time are the characteristic traits of Freud's death instinct, which does not seek death but an oceanic oneness with the world, the emotional equilibrium of the womb and the cessation of desire. Eastern religions describe it as a state of nothingness or emptiness. The fundamental morbidity of such an attitude is not that it desires death but is blissfully unaware of it. Marshall McLuhan correctly pointed out that Narcissus thought his reflection in the water was someone else and this is exactly the problem with modern mathematicians, as James C. Scott said of high modernism, they unwittingly try to make the world in their own image. In this case, we find a coy on a Scott C. world of circuited roads and skyscraper windows blinking like rows of computer lights. This movement is embodied in the water machine economy portrayed by the documentarian Adam Curtis in his television series Pandora's Box. The mathematical enterprise is part of what Christopher Lash called the religion of progress, which is at root Faustian, as described by Oswald Spengler. Mathematical reductionism is ultimately a reckless and dangerous force. It is no coincidence that the mathematical obsession with unboundedness and infinity corresponds with the modern world's rejection of limits. However, the actual impact of mathematics and science has been greatly exaggerated. The scientific revolution never led to great advancements in living standards, which didn't rise substantially until the 1870s, and the history of invention includes few academics. Many important discoveries were even the result of lucky accidents, such as antibiotics, dynamite, the pacemaker, and inoculation. Mathematicians labored for decades trying to improve navigation to no avail, until the chronometer was invented by a poorly educated English carpenter, John Harrison. Most of the early understanding of chemistry was discovered through the pseudoscience of alchemy and everything from steel, steam, looms, sewing machines to photography, spread spectrum, jet engines, microwaves, and household appliances were pioneered by amateurs and non-scientists. Historian Robert Allen has explained that the main driver of the Industrial Revolution in Britain was the pressure on capitalists from abnormally high wages. The classical mechanics of Newton were known since the 17th century but it took the Wright brothers in the 20th century, who were not even college educated, to invent flight. Thomas Edison complained that he couldn't even understand Newton's Principia. Faraday was not even good with mathematics and Grassmann, who we still have not caught up to, with coordinate free geometric algebra, was a theologian. Modern GPS doesn't even need the theory of relativity, as it's a simple calibration error, and modern semiconductors only needed the discovery of proper doping materials. The first Turing-complete modern computer was created by Conrad Zusa, a German civil engineer who is also properly credited with stored programming and the first thesis on high-level programming. Like Zusa, Claude Shannon was not even aware of Turing's secretive work and was scolded by Turing when they finally met. Eckert and Moshley were not aware of Turing and have even debunked accounts of von Neumann's involvement with the ENIAC. Practical people built the computer and not mathematicians and physicists but the revisionism invading the historical accounts has the relentlessness of Orwellian propaganda. The cyclonic bagless vacuum was invented by an interior designer before mathematicians and computer modelers even showed up to explain it. In fact, this very problem is computationally very difficult and it's hard to achieve realistic conditions with computer simulations. Of course, the computers have given mathematics new life in areas like business optimization. Excel has built-in optimizers and teaching people mini-zinc programming is actually quite easy. The solvers can be quite complicated but they're done by a dedicated and small number of people. The current revolution in artificial intelligence is about the chain rule of calculus, backpropagation, and the chain rule of Bayesian probability, probabilistic graphical models. Mathematicians and academic researchers like Marvin Minsky were condescending to those such as Rosenblatt and Hinton because they thought these tools couldn't compute elementary functions. It turned out that they were completely and utterly wrong. Even modern error correction came from graph-based methods discovered by a French engineer, who invented turbo code. The mathematicians were too busy counting zeros of the Riemann zeta function to even discover autoencoders. To this day, academics and computer scientists have not leveraged finite field computations to achieve fast rational arithmetic to replace error-prone and inexact floating-point computation. Classic calculations like DFT can be done completely rationally and to arbitrary precision. Today, mathematics has largely been overtaken by computers, so researchers mostly investigate extremes no sane person finds even remotely interesting, that is unless their jobs rely on it or they still wet the bed. The same can be said for most physics, which wastes tens of billions of tax dollars hunting for trivia. Even though we live in a world of unbounded chaos and complexity, 
there are still many who labor under the delusion of enlightenment optimism, high modernism, and technocratic government, and who still attempt to apply mathematical modeling to large-scale phenomena or society. I don't find it that surprising that index funds outperform active management, that DSGE models cannot predict a single quarter ahead, that weather models provide few reliable predictions or that earthquake prediction has stalled, even with massive Japanese investment. It turns out that mathematics is just a mapping and modeling language that only deals with lower order effects and surface relationships. The three little coupled differential equations of Edward Lorenz had awoken the mathematical world to what it should have understood all along, the world is a bafflingly complex place and toy models only model toy realities. The idea that math underlies reality was completely destroyed with the invention of group theory and dynamical systems, where we found that fifth degree polynomials and n-body problems could not even be given general solutions. Of course, modern fundamental physics is completely computable, including fluid flow and lattice gauge theory. People who make issues over unification don't understand that we can compute all observables and the math works perfectly fine. What we really have are possibly irresolvable empirical gaps concerning issues like black holes or dark matter, along with intractable computation, which renders most low-level understanding useless. Almost all of modern mathematics is automatable and much of the modeling is redundant to most areas of engineering. Maybe you want a little topological optimization on some propeller blades but custom work is fairly rare. Excessive engineering is usually motivated by the creation of planned obsolescence and slowness model changes. Most usable mathematics consists of repeatable one-timers, where people simply use MATLAB, Maple, Mathematica, R, MiniZinc, Minitab, SolidWorks, Maya, C++, Julia, Ansys, etc. for most tasks. Cryptography is elementary and just requires a few simple libraries. There is some demand for formal software verification but most modern mathematics is more obsessed with various forms of mental masturbation, so such methods are rarely taught in universities. Supercomputers are largely a waste of money used for doing glorified dot products for made-up government problems. In business, an office secretary can run some hierarchical clustering or regressions on sales or patient data with a few clicks of the mouse. It's barely minimum wage labor but a fad created by government coddling and education cartels. Not only have mathematicians and scientists made little or no advancement on things like weather and economic prediction but have massively failed the world of research with an amazing lack of reproducibility. To be fair, this is largely an issue with poor educations but bad mathematics has tainted huge amounts of prominent and influential research. No matter how much they fail, we hear endless praise for the level of genius emanating from the field. Nothing succeeds like the appearance of success. Many pure mathematicians, like G. H. Hardy, take pride in their ideas precisely because they are useless. Then I would ask how an aristocratic pastime got funded by the government and university system. I agree that issues of empiricism really have nothing to do with mathematics and my point here is not to argue with Platonism. At the most basic level, mathematics is supposed to be at least self-consistent. Mathematics is not philosophy and it's not physics. Confused questions about a mathematical continuum, such as we see with the continuum hypothesis, are not really problems but squabbles over definitions. Stanford mathematician Solomon Pfefferman, has cast doubt on the meaningfulness of the continuum hypothesis, but I can go further to say it is trivially undecidable from the standpoint of existing mathematical systems. The implication of Godel's incompleteness theorems shows a profound ignorance about what they actually prove. The first half of the argument didn't even need a proof. If you ask a system if it is consistent because you are unsure of its consistency, then it can tell you it is consistent by simple logical explosion. This is not an original argument of Godel and it was foolish of Hilbert to even ask such a thing. The point about undecidability is even more silly. I might ask a person if they stopped beating their wife, yes or no. It turns out that the law of the excluded middle is the problem in mathematics. Things can be true, false, and meaningless. Colorless green ideas sleep furiously. This is a grammatical statement, just like Godel's statements are well-formed formulas. It doesn't mean they make any sense. To reveal the absurdity about incompleteness, consider the fact that an infinitely axiomatized schema gets rid of it. In fact, Godel's argument is just a rehashing of Cantor's diagonalization argument and Turing's argument is just a rehashing of Godel's. The problem with all three is that they don't understand the nature of a proof by contradiction. When you derive a contradiction, it doesn't tell you explicitly which assumptions led to it. The most obvious problems are the completed infinities and impredicative definitions. These are self-contradictory assumptions, and what are misleadingly called paradoxes, result from these elementary contradictions. You don't have to derive anything to find a contradiction because they are built right into the initial foundations. There is no completed infinite list of real numbers, no completed infinite set of programs, and no completed totality of all properties. Similarly, there is no well-defined functional mapping for Cantor's power set argument. It's not surprising that such assumptions lead to, quote-unquote, surprising results. Who really thinks it's a meaningful limit to not know the behavior of a computer at the limit of infinite runtime? Such infantile lines of reasoning are meant for the children's table. Mathematicians are notorious for blowing trivial problems completely out of proportion. A prominent case of impossibility in mathematics concerns the very ancient problem of trisecting the angle. Of course, the assumption is that you can only use a compass and square. When you include a piece of string unwrapped from a circle, you can easily create Archimedes' spiral, which can then be used to trisect the angle, square the circle, do inverse trig and inscribe polygons. Anyone that has seen the buy one get one free Bonoktarsky paradox should immediately suspect that mathematics has a screw loose. In fact, real analysis is just a degenerate case of discrete analysis. This reveals the nature of what is misleadingly called continuity in mathematics, where we find that continuous versus discrete, 
does not mean whole versus parts, but infinitely discrete versus discrete. This is a false dichotomy. As mentioned in a 1996 article by Alba Papa Grimaldi, all the mathematical responses to Zeno entirely miss the point. Mathematics is not physics or philosophy but merely map making. Mathematics cannot answer deep questions about the universe because it is only a modeling language going in human invented circles of reasoning. Stephen Smale's solution to sphere aversion assumed that surfaces can pass through one another. It was a purely abstract problem. The invention of non-Euclidean geometry was supposedly a major invention for physics but it turns out that Poincaré's point about conventionalism still holds. A flat space gauge theory in physics can easily be created with geometric algebra and has been constructed by David Hestenes and others. It turns out that mathematics offers multiple perspectives that are completely equivalent and the math tells you nothing about physical reality. What can be said with certainty is that mathematicians have been spending too much time in front of the mirror. Maybe one day they will finally discover that 3.14 spells pi backwards.